All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our Fusion Friday. My name is Brian Mokopunsuk. I'm a customer success manager here at Kativ Technologies. Uh, I'm also joined by my good friend, Marty, who is a technical marketing manager at Autodesk. How's it going, Marty? Hey, good. Glad to be here. Hey, thanks for hopping on. So uh, yeah, today, I don't know if you guys can see my screen here, but yeah, today we will be going into what's new in Fusion 360 um, from the January to 20, uh, to April 2021 timeframe. Uh, this has, it, we're bringing this out around the time of the new 2022 AutoCAD Inventor and Vault. Uh, as you may already know, Fusion 360 doesn't have a 2021 or 2022 version because you're always on the latest and greatest version of it. But we wanted to still update you in case you haven't been uh, updated on what's what are some of the new tools and technology that Fusion 360 has come out with. Uh, so with that said, the first half I'll be doing is on the design and engineering, like modeling and user interface uh, side of things for about 15 minutes or so. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Marty for the second half, uh, which is what's new in manufacturing or the CAM environment. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely stay through to the, uh, the end of it and you can um, check that out. And then this will be recorded, of course, and um, posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you need to reference it later, you can definitely do so. And if you have any questions, as always, leave that in the uh, Zoom chat window, and uh, we will be monitoring that as we progress here. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start off. I have this slide here that we'll be referencing. Uh, and you can reference this when you refer back to it in the video of what the uh, what I'll be going over just to give us you know an agenda. Uh, so let me go ahead and get into the first one, which is the 10 document limit for personal use. So if you are familiar with the personal use um, thing that Autodesk recently did where since October of 2020, I believe is the date, uh, anyone with a personal use uh, Fusion 360 uh, license, uh, you're limited to having 10, um, up to 10 active um, models, up to 10 active uh, items that you can edit within Fusion 360. So if you take a look here at the left-hand side, you can see that there's a couple that are editable, some that are read-only. And if you can see here, it says three of 10, it's referring to maybe the three editable ones that we have seen here on the screen. And then the rest, you can still have, looks like more than the 10 uh, items, um, but they can't all be uh, editable. Only 10 of them can be. So just keep that in mind if personal use applies to you. Um, if you have a full-fledged license or if you have the product design and manufacturing collection, which is a full-fledged license of Fusion 360, this is not something you would have to worry about, but I think it's worth mentioning since it is an update nonetheless. And let me go back to item number two here. So now I'll be going into Fusion. Uh, so the second one is extensions is a plug icon. So just like I stated there, if we take a look here in Fusion and I take a look at the top uh, right-hand corner where there's a plug rather than a wrench here at the top, this is going to be um where the extensions are if you're trying to add uh, generative design as an extension uh some cam and i'll leave uh this for uh, marty to maybe discuss later but there's some additive and nesting uh, add-ins here as well so just keep that in mind the rest of your options if you're looking for it would be under preferences and there would be some preview features here um, if you can't find it in those extensions. And speaking of which, the next uh, op, uh, the next what's new is the high dots per inch or DPI scaling for Windows machines that had issues earlier or previously with viewing um, and scaling Fusion 360 models or Fu the Fusion 360 window. So as long as you turn this on, and, and this might not apply to you, but if, if, you did, if you did have that issue with maybe Fusion kind of scaling uh, weird on your, on your monitor, um, 
you can turn this on and you can close, and this is only for Windows, and you can close Fusion 360, open it back up, and then if you had a 200% or higher DPI uh, set, then this would help to fix some of those bug issues that you might may have experienced earlier. The next one is a new project navigation experience, which is no longer in preview mode. So this is referring to the web browser view of Fusion 360. If you haven't been there already, you can access this anywhere you have access to the internet, which is really neat. Uh, I can get navigate to it here. You can navigate to it on a web browser by typing in like Fusion Team and then just signing in and accessing it. Um, but essentially, okay, this is a personal hub. Let me let me hop over to a team hub here. I have a part of a bunch of these hubs here. And then essentially on the left-hand side here, it allows you to see all your projects and you can scroll through them really quickly and easily and accessible. Little things, but it makes a, a big difference when, when you're working here uh, often and you can just search for whatever you are you know, looking for. Not a, not a crazy, not, not a lot that I can talk about there. Just, just showing you uh, what's, what's new. Uh, regarding that but this one's a huge one that i will be showing uh the thin extrude option so if i go back in here to fusion and this is really applicable also for plastic parts so if i wanted to create maybe a plastic looking like injected molded part or something based off this profile here uh, maybe before i would do a project um maybe i'll just start showing parts of that actually I would do a project, I might do some offsets, uh, and then I put in a value. Looks like it's in feet or something there. I put in a value for each one of these, and then I would do the extrusion. So it's a couple of steps there. And even then I I would need to um let me let me extrude that part actually. There we go. And then I would start to get to the design that I'm looking for. Um, but with the new thin extrude feature, I'm going to undo all that. Instead of having to go through all that hassle, what you can do is I can just go to the straight to the extrude tool. I can select the profile that I want. And normally, that's what you'd get, right? You just pull it out and it'll look something like that. Um, but instead, I'm going to go and choose thin extrude. And then when I um, extrude that out, you can see how it it gave me a thickness that I can uh, adjust here. Let's say I'm in feet <laughs> um, that I could adjust there. And yeah, I didn't have to go through project. I didn't have to do, go through offset. And from my modeling experience, without having to create extra sketches for that it makes your model lighter. And maybe if you're creating a huge assembly, it would be better for the long run as well. And uh, you still have the ability to edit your the value not in the sketch but you can edit it in the 3d uh, feature itself i, I had a, a rule uh, for myself to create where you can try to create 3d features as opposed to 2d features like a fillet uh create like a 3d fillet as opposed to a 2d maybe like 90 percent of the time it would make more sense because it makes it lighter and you can edit the feature itself and not the you don't have to go into the sketch so uh that's a that's a little rule i had for myself personally all right, so that one's a really big update for sure. Um, the untrimmed surface tool. So if we go back in here and we look at this surface body, and you can see that it's a surface body by this orange symbol there. You can see that there's a big hole that I made on purpose. So I can show this one of this features. So if you need some cleaning up for some of your surface models, you can just go over modify. You can go to untrim and before this let me just show the the way you would normally go about patching this hole is you'd use the patch tool you just hit patch there you would hit patch here and then you'd have to go to stitch and then click on those three entities in order to patch it and make it go away let me undo all that And now instead with the untrim tool, so it's like the opposite of extend and and uh, trim. It's it's untrim and um 
and um, what do you call it? And uh, extend. So you would just go to untrim here. And instead of doing all that patching and stitching, you just click on the, the uh, face once. And you can choose different types of untrim features, which I'll let you dive into if you need to. Um, and then that's it. You, then I got the same exact results with just essentially two clicks as opposed to a six or seven. Um, and it cleaned up my surface there for me. All right. The next one, ISO curve analysis. So this one's really neat. Um, so if we go back to fusion, uh, ISO curve example here. So this helps you to analyze your surface body. So this will help more of those um, organic uh, freeform body uh, surface modeling people. If you have a surface body and you want to kind of see the curvature of it, or you want to make sure it's tangential, or if 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 the design is very reliant on it flowing smooth from transitioning from one body to another, uh, you can use you can go under inspect the ISO curve analysis. So go ahead and select the body or face that I want to ana analyze, and it's going to create this very dramatic. Um, kind of bump that goes above the um, the uh, surface body. And you can see that, yes, there was a bump there, but did you know there was one that kind of, uh, there was an indent that went on over here. So it kind of helps to exaggerate that. You can control the density and then the scaling of this. And you can control whether you just want to see it one way or the other way. Uh, so yeah, you have that flexibility and you have another tool under your belt uh, to help analyze your um, your surface bodies here. And it's it's considered another another uh, thing you can toggle on and off here on the left hand side. Next, we have the text spacing percentage. So this one's really neat as well. as let me go ahead and go to I believe it's this example here. yep. So if you wanted to create text that went on a maybe circular um, circular part of, part of a model, you can go ahead and, and you can go ahead and start the sketch here. Let me create some construction lines just real quick. Just gonna right click and make those construction lines. And then I'll make my reference construction line there. And now if I go to create text, I can choose the text along a path. So if you didn't know that that exists, it does exist <laughs> here in Fusion. I know it didn't exist once upon a time. Uh, and you could choose whether you wanted to place it below or above, and I want to place it above. And right now you can see that it's just placing it whether I wanted to go right or, or left, it's not placing where I want it to be, which here. Uh, so let me go ahead and just make a reference line so I can actually clean this up. Trim this. So now I only have that line I can use as a reference, uh, which gives it less room to run away from me. There we go. Uh, and then, so what the new part about this tool, I know all this stuff is, is actually not new. This has already existed in Fusion, but what's really new is this character space in here. So if I put a one, you can see there was a subtle movement of it spacing it apart, this value of one. Uh, if you do like 40, it brings it apart even more. Uh, if we do a hundred, it, it does go lower to the bottom part here. I wouldn't necessarily say 100 is to the final extent of where this line is. Um, because if we did you know, higher, higher numbers, but essentially what it does is creates the gap in between your text in case you need it to be a certain way like that. And then let me just create the extrusion for this. Oh, I didn't place my text. Give me one moment. Sample or T sample X. Yeah, see if I put a hundred here, it, it doesn't go to the extent of that. It just it just puts in a hundred spacing in between each. 
and then now if, sorry i keep liking to click ahead here and you select that hit extrude and then i can put engrave that into my my model there all right next is the center line type option so this one is pretty straightforward and but it's pretty helpful just use it when when you come across this scenario so if you have let me uh make this a a non center line first so if you have a normal line like this and you want to do a revolve and instead of just making it a construction line a normal construction line make it a normal center line and what this does is when you go to use the revolve tool let me do that again revolve it's going to automatically pick up the the model or the the profile that you want to revolve because it was created as a center line so it saves you a step of having to find whatever profile that is because you use the center line as a tool and it's just a good practice to to use the center line as opposed to a normal construction line if you know it's the center of your a cylindrical model. Export to ANSYS. So if you don't know what ANSYS is, it's a, a company that creates high-end high um, simulation software. And if I were to create a simulation off this model, I create some, some constraints, some loads, uh, I run the simulation, what you can do is you have this new tool here where you can export this to an ANSYS setup or an ANSYS software uh, to do even deeper analysis if you if you need to. Uh, so if that applies to you, then this is available to quickly send it to ANSYS. Uh, we here at Kativ have a ANSYS uh, team and we support ANSYS. So let us know or let me know if you have any questions on that or you'd like to learn more. All right, now we're halfway through uh, slope symbols and break view. So we're going to knock two birds in one stone. Here, um, if I go to my drawing here. So first off, break view, which I've been kind of waiting for <laughs> about two years ago, I was looking for this and it wasn't there, but now it's here. I don't know if that was too quick, but I selected two parts of the model for my break view. And it essentially shortened the model. So then it doesn't take up the entire space. It saves space uh, for models that are long and like you don't really need to see that part. You kind of understand that it's the same thing throughout, right? Uh, and then you can dimension it. Um, and it'll have that little break in the dimension. So that's just like a nice little feature that that's uh, in the drawing environment now. And we also have the taper and slope uh, tool. So if you just find a taper or a slope on your model, you have access to these symbols now, like the leader, but you have actual slope symbols or taper symbols. And you can put in the value here and you can check this box to box it to make it theoretically exact. So know that those two tools are now in Fusion. Assembly concurrency. Uh, so this one, I'm going to ask uh, if Marty can help me out just a tad here. Um, if I go here to our our um, our grip, or sorry, our fusion assembly here, we can see with and this is a huge feature by the way, assembly concurrency. So if we go here to the data panel. This wasn't here before. But you can see my my initial there B with a little white circle that stands for it's reserved by me. If it doesn't have a white circle next to it, that means I haven't made any changes uh, to it and I just have it open. But if it has a white circle, that means I made a change to it and it can be saved and it will change the model. That's the difference there. And it even has anyone in your uh in your team work if they have it open or if they're working on it it looks like um marty has it here um and she's working on it it kind of allows you to see whether or not you know oh should i make should i talk to marty first about before i editing before i go in and edit the grip 
um, gives you that knowledge beforehand. And yeah, if she, Marty, if you can change the color of the grip and save that, we can maybe see the, and then I can start to see in the, an update here on my end uh, for me to change that, that, uh, that a change has been made. Looks like that has been done. So I'll go ahead and hit refresh there. Looks like it changed red. So I'm going to go ahead and it says one component out of date. Continue. So it's going to be this error there or this warning there, not error. And the change has been made. And Mar the little white uh, symbol next to Mari's name has, is gone now because the change is now applied and we have the same version uh, on our local workspace here. And that, that grip was linked uh, through this little uh, icon there. So just wanted to show that that this is now inside of Fusion and it would show multiple names here um, of who else is working on this assembly. So assembly concurrency, it not only works for Fusion models, but if you have step files or other files as well, uh, that's being referenced into this model, it, it can, you can essentially have visibility to all of that all in your workspace, which is really huge and really awesome. So if you have any questions on any of this, feel free to leave that in the chat room. More than happy to answer that. Uh, sketch chamfer, very, very straightforward. I'm gonna do a quick little example of that. It really is what it sounds like. And it, and uh, finally have it, <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's this tool here. So you have three different ones, but it's, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You can create a chamfer, no, no uh, mind blowing. Uh, tool, the uh, new tool there. Um, chain fillets. So this one's actually pretty neat. So I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, there we go. So when you create a fill before, you would, you know, if I created a fillet on these edges here, and I'm going to give it a parameter f underscore one equals 0 0.05. And now if I create a fillet on this edge that was created because I had to combine those two and I call this F underscore two um, point one. Normally when I go back to edit the previous fillet, like let's make this point one now, it would mess up and give us a, an error. But now it just updates the second fillet or any other fillets with us. So that's what the this new feature was, is the chain fillets. Um, I know I'm running close to time here, so let me go a little bit faster. Uh, so joint origin direction. Essentially, when if you work with joint origins before, then this is relevant to you. If you haven't, then uh, joint origin is essentially, it helps you to create like, points of reference for your assembly creation. So if I click joint origin, usually it's represented or it was represented by like a little half circle. Now it's represented by this uh, little origin axis looking uh, feature that you can rotate around and things like that. Um, it essentially helps you to helps you to understand how the joint origin works or what it is in reference to the model. Zooming in too much here. So now, I, now that I have a joint origin there, uh, I can maybe, if I were to put this in an assembly, I could use that as a reference to kind of connect the, associate the, the two components together. All right, uh, navigate tree through with arrow keys and then change parameters automatically adds to favorite. So I'm gonna knock out two of those. So essentially, if you click on a folder here or a, a feature, you can just use arrow keys to go up and down through it. Nothing crazy, but it's still cool to, to have and to know. And then also the parameters. So remember I created F underscore one and two. If I go into my parameters list here, uh, now it's saved as a favorite, as opposed to before you'd have to dig through your model parameters to find that. Uh, Fusion is smart enough to recognize that those are probably important because we created those and name them specifically um, to be put in there. We have um, the full round fillet 
and then smart templates. This last one's huge. Um, and the last one being, then I'm going to hand it off to Marty for manufacturing, um, but full round fillet. So let me hide this grip. If you saw that this was sticking out, I did that for a reason is because I wanted to show that under fillet, uh, you would first, if you were to create a regular fillet to make, try to make this round, it'd look like that, or it might be off like that or something like that. There it is perfectly, but that just happened to be a good number. But um, if we go to full round fillet, which is new, uh, you can click on it and it'll create a fully perfectly rounded fillet. Pretty nice, pretty straightforward. And the last one is the template, is a drawing template. And this is huge for automating drawing creation. So if I go over here to file new drawing template, I'll create one from scratch. And it's if I place in a base view, um, this is just a random assembly that uh, Fusion uses as a reference here, but it's it essentially allows you to place in these views here. You can place in a the parts list, a generic one, and then if you want, you can edit your title block. I put it approved by myself, and then so this is for an assembly. If you then if you go to Quick Add here to create another sheet. I could reference maybe just a one component instead and create a projected view, you know, maybe a bottom and a isometric again and with another table. And I'll put my name one more time. And once we save this, we'll call it template. Um, if I go back to maybe this is assembly, for example, we can go to, um, I can, or sorry, I can create a, a new drawing from this for, for this assembly. And we can use that new template I created. We'll make the structure all levels and sure, we'll include external components. So since this is a new feature in Fusion, see, look at what it does for us now. Boom, boom, boom. Created seven drawings for us, all referencing that assembly, or the first one's the assembly itself. As you can see here, it's it was crazy fast. I don't know if you caught it all. Um, that actually should have put approved, but anyways, but the main port, uh, part of it came in here. For each of the parts, it created the, the two view, the three views that I had as well, as well as the parts list. Same for all of those parts in the assembly, even the uh, external reference, because I checked that box. So yeah, and you can go in, of course, and, and move it around uh, to make it look exactly the way you want it to, but it saves you a lot of time from having to click the base view, insert it, and project it, and things like that. So very, very cool uh, template and tool to have that now that it does it for all your parts as well, it makes it look very professional. Uh, so I know I went over my time a good amount. Sorry about that, Marty. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Uh, now we're going to go into the the what's new in manufacturing from January to April. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, and, and no worries. Let me share my screen. Um, like Brian showed, I think probably the biggest update is that we added a new extension, the nesting and fabrication extension. I'm gonna save the best for last so I can get through a couple more general updates. Um, and our last update in April was what we called quality of life. So it was basically just clearing out a ton of small, um, not big workflow changing features, but just like little, customer delights is maybe another way to say them, um, quality of life updates to help make the overall fusion manufacturing experience better. Um, so I'll talk about those first and then we'll get into some of the nesting and fabrication stuff. Um, so I have this part, I think some of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite updates are in the stock simulation actually. So if I go to simulate, um, there's a ton of new checkboxes. If you're familiar with the manufacturing workspace in Fusion, you've probably done a stock simulation. You've probably seen, uh, let's slow it down a little bit. I have a ton more options here to show points, um, show the 
links or leads or cutting moves or none. I can check or uncheck all of those. If you have a big complicated part with a ton of leads and links and you're just interested in looking at the cutting toolpath, um, no big deal. You can just switch them off here, which mirrors what you can do in the uh, navigation bar at the bottom, just outside of a stock simulation. So it's a little more consistent across all the ways to view a toolpath. Um, the other new thing is the accuracy slider. Uh, I would say be careful <laughs> because if you really crank the accuracy up, the, um, the speed can get really slow. So I'll try to drag it a little bit in the other direction. Mine's been a little bit misbehaving today, but um, it will change. You'll see like more faceting on the sides, like how that you can kind of see the mesh on this circle because it's made of a bunch of triangles. You can see the faceting get really, really fine as you push the accuracy up or really, really uh, coarse as you push the accuracy down. And it will like, yeah, I would just be careful about kind of knowing, know your computer, know your graphics card. If you you don't have the horsepower to, <laughs> to crank the accuracy up super high, don't. Um, but if you really need to see what something's gonna look like super accurately, it's a nice tool to have in your back pocket. Probably my favorite update to the stock simulation is typically, I'll figure out this one. Typically we move the tool relative to the part um, in stock simulation, which makes a ton of sense if you're using like a three axis mill. Um, sometimes your, your table is moving in X and Y and the tool is moving in Z, that's a common configuration, but it's it makes sense to view those tool paths from the, the frame of the tool moving only. Like it's a, it's a very easy way to kind of watch what's happening. But in some cases, like in rotary tool path, this looks kind of weird. <laughs> like typically the spindle would be rotating and the tool would be either stationary or moving only in um, X and Y or Z. So under view, we now have an option to change the viewpoint to the tool viewpoint, which will move the model instead probably a good best practice is to pause your simulation before you try to change any of these things. <laughs> so I'll do that. And now the part moves relative to the tool. So for in some cases, it's not exactly correct, right? Like it's not exactly what you would see on the machine. Um, so it's not a one-to-one -one of machine simulation or anything, but it is way more accurate for like, <laughs> for some of these tool paths and then it will keep going, right? So. Now we've we've reached a point where it doesn't really make sense anymore. Definitely made sense for the rotary toolpath. Maybe doesn't make as much sense for some of these turning toolpaths. Um, I'll change back to the model view, and we'll skip ahead to the drilling and boring because another update is when you have a section analysis created, you can turn that on in a stock simulation. So this is really nice for being able to see what's going on inside your model. In this case, um, I have a turned part, so it's nice for me to be able to see like what is, what does my tool actually look like when it's going in and doing boring, and I can be really certain that I'm not going to have a big collision or anything you know bad going on in there. I think this could also be really useful even for milling applications, uh, just to see what's going on inside of a pocket or um, yeah, behind a wall where it, where it can be difficult to see what's going on. So this is a really nice update and I'll quickly show y'all how to make one just to be sure that y'all know that. It's under the inspect menu along with our accessibility analysis tools, um, minimum radius analysis tools, which are super helpful for like choosing a, a tool, for example. You can also do a section analysis You'll pick any face. So if you have a more planar model that you're cutting, um, it might make more sense. For me, I will turn on the origin in the model menu, and then you can just drag it along this plane. So easy way to be able to see what's going on inside of your model, super helpful for a ton of different applications. And then those appear in this analysis section of the browser. Let me pull up my notes really quick. Um, cool. Another update uh, that's just a quality of life, like general will apply to everyone update is when you pick a toolpath now, any toolpath or multiple toolpaths, the machining time appears in the lower right hand corner. So before you had to kind of dig through some context menus to find this, it would open a separate dialogue. Now, just by virtue of selecting it, 
and even the setup. So you can select toolpath setups, multiple, single, and it will tell you the machining time for those operations, which is really nice. So it's a quick, easy way to see um, you know, how long things are gonna take or estimate how long things are gonna take in the shop just by, just by clicking. Okay, and then to get into a couple extension updates actually, and this is in the machining extension, which like Brian pointed out, you can access uh, up here in the plug icon. So I have, I have mine accessed already. I think the options are um, daily, monthly, and annual. Typically that there will be a little access options uh, button here that you can use. And I think there's a seven day trial as well for free that resets annually. So definitely check out the free trial. I think it's great that we offer that. Just know that it will reset after one calendar year. So if you, if you use it, um, be sure you're ready to kind of put some time in. So one of the, one of the things that we added to the extension is this option under tool orientation. If I didn't have the extension on, I would uh, be selecting like a planar face or work geometry. So it's showing me the origin because I can also pick axes or planes. Um, I can pick any planar face or actually this is a curved face. So if I pick a face with a radius, it's gonna go along the center of that radius. So if I pick a more obvious one like that, the Z is still pointing like in the center of that cylinder, a little hard to tell there. But what we've added is tilt and turn handles and an align to view option, which is really nice for if you have something freeform um, or maybe like there, there aren't <laughs> any great faces to pick or creating construction geometry is just a little bit time consuming. Um, you can align the view perpendicular to how you want the tool to point and then click this align to view button. So now the Z is pointing basically straight into the screen from how I aligned my view. I can also, of course, pick a different origin point. That makes a little more sense. Um, can align to view again. You can align to view as many times as you want um, <laughs> over and over. Just know that it will, like, it's not capturing anything in time. So if you get a view that you really like, um, I would say hit OK on the toolpath and, and then maybe make an another one. One of my kind of favorite things about Fusion is it's really easy to duplicate. Don't, <laughs> this toolpath looks a little crazy, but it's really easy to duplicate a toolpath or create a derived operation of that exact same type of toolpath, which opens the dialogue for you. And then you can go in and kind of fiddle around. Um, the tilt and turn handles are these graphical handles here that I can use to just quickly manipulate. Um, the orientation. So this is also nice for if you, again, don't really, don't want to create construction geometry, know the exact angles you want to enter, or just want to kind of drag it around until it looks good. All are very valid ways to um, do your tool orientation, which is pretty awesome. And this is through the machining extension. If you don't have that, you'll just get the normal tool orientation controls where you can pick um, axes, faces, or any work geometry. Most tool paths look crazy. <laughs> the other thing we've added to the extension is uh, tool path trimming has been around for a while now. So you can edit a tool path by creating a polygon and trimming what's inside or outside of that polygon. I think we've got a good name view for this. Yeah. So I created this polygon. You can drag the points around to edit it. Um, it does capture this in time on this little timeline down here. And what we've added recently is the notes. So the kind of tricky part of toolpath editing is capturing the intent, especially if you're going to collaborate with someone else who might not know, you know what, what you were thinking when you made that toolpath edit. So now when you make the edit initially, or if you need to go back and change some of your models, you can type notes here, like, waterfall segments, for example. And then once uh, it's created, if I hover over the trim in the timeline, it shows me, <laughs> it fades pretty slowly, but it shows me the notes. So it's way easier to kind of work across different folks when you're um, doing any toolpath editing, which is, which is very nice. 
And I think that is, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. I would say like definitely check out the update video for April. There's a ton, a ton, ton, ton of stuff. The team worked really hard and did a great job. And I think even in the update video, I only cover like 40 something of over 160 updates. So big update in April, lots of little quality of life delights. Um, let us know what you like for sure. Like the Autodesk team, let Brian know, <laughs> the Kativ team. I'm sure they would love to hear it as well. Um, and then another big update, probably potentially the biggest one is the nesting and fabrication extension, which again, you can access through this little plug icon. Um, there's a daily option. So that's what I have. Hopefully it doesn't go out halfway through because I was using it yesterday, but very easy to turn back on. And I think like the, the brilliance of having nesting uh, integrated with all the rest of Fusion 360 is that it's really easy to go from design to nest to manufacture. So I'll give kind of the quick version of this because I know we're a bit short on time. So I'll do speed demo. Um, and this kind of integration, the magic of this integration starts with nest preparation, which is in the design workspace. I don't know why that's been happening. I think it's my Mac. <laughs> it's very old. So here I can automatically Fusion automatically filters parts into sheet metal, sketches, and everything else, basically, because it's, while it is a valid workflow to nest non-sheet metal parts or non-sketches, it's not as common, so that we generally lump them together. In this case, I have a snowplow where everything is sheet metal, so I'm going to ignore everything but sheet metal. That gets reflected in this list, which I can um, kind of click through and make adjustments. So if something was incorrectly filtered, I could change the filter here. I can um, ignore, oops, I could ignore individual components. If for some reason I didn't want this one to be nested, I could, instead of, instead of keeping that automatic sheet metal filtering, I can say it's one of, actually it's one of these or just ignore it in general. So really easy to, um, grab everything in your model that you want to nest. A couple notes quickly. Uh, the nesting algorithm looks at components, not at bodies. So every component needs to be a single body component to correctly nest uh, everything inside. If it's not, it'll just like lump those bodies together, which is generally speaking, not what people are going for. Um, so it's a little bit of a design uh, thought process change to maybe put one sheet metal body in one sheet metal component. Um, they also need a flat pattern. So while we'll automatically unfold and flatten things, we won't automatically create a flat pattern for you. Partially because um, things need to be modeled correctly to be flattened. So there could be downstream errors if we don't kind of have you flatten them on the way. I, I'm not, to be honest, 100% sure if that's something we have on the roadmap, although it would be really nice <laughs> to automatically create flat patterns for everything. So to nest single body component with a flat pattern, um, doesn't have to be sheet metal necessarily, like I said, but it is that is kind of what it is best at, I guess, or what I've had the most success doing. So then we'll hop into the manufacturer workspace um, and go to the fabrication tab, which is where all the nesting commands live. You can jump right into nesting. Um, you don't have to set up anything really. You don't have to set up custom materials or that's pretty much it. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't have to. Um, you'll miss out on a couple like what I, what I would say are valuable things like cost analysis. If I open up the process material library, I can see my materials and packaging at the material level. We have a bunch of material information. Um, it lists all the packaging below. So this is where you can have different sheet sizes or like custom sheet sizes or maybe uh, remnants. And then the nesting parameters for this material. So anything that is steel, this is another note actually, um, the material, <laughs> sorry, I got some construction going on. Hopefully that's not too loud. Um, the material is pulled in from the material set in the design workspace. So make sure that is correct. It That's where it pulls from basically to correctly sort it onto a sheet here. At the packaging level, you have the size, the shape, and then the cost. So entering the cost here is nice for 
looking at the nested results downstream in the compare dialog or the reports, it'll give you some nice costing information. The other cool thing we can do before actually nesting is pull in multiple sources. So from here, oh no, gotta find my data set. So what this does is basically pulls in other um, other parts to be nested or other designs to be nested so that I can open. So I have a different configuration of the same snowplow, um, different sizing. So then I can nest more than one thing at once without affecting the design in the design workspace, which is really nice. So I don't have to, it's basically on the back end, I think doing a drive in, but it's not going to affect anything on the design side. So I don't have to go grab all these things, put them in one model, make this big like garage sale thing in the design workspace. I can just add them in component sources. And I get all my information here. I can override some nest properties at this point. I think there is another opportunity to do that later on, but this window is really nice. Okay, now we're ready to nest. Um, one nice thing about having multiple models is I can do multi-value quantities. So let's say I wanna do maybe 10 of the other configuration and five of this one. I can enter those here. In the shapes tab of the nesting dialog, it shows me not only all the things I'm about to nest and with a little preview if I hover over, but also how many shapes are selected and then the total number of parts to be nested, which is just a little bit of math based on this quantity and then the quantity of each part in the design to be nested. So it's just nice to have it, you know, tell you instead of you having to kind of sit down with the calculator. And that was also part of our quality of life release in April. I can review the packaging to be used, um, look at the nesting parameters. So I can set the minimum and maximum compute times, which will limit the total time that the nest algorithm takes. And then I can also tell it what to solve for. So minimizing length will shove everything to the uh, left of the sheet. Minimizing width, I think, shoves it to the bottom. And then length times width would give me a nice, like a, a non-rectangular remnant, but that's in the shape of like an L. I like minimize length, but obviously you could use whichever one suits your process. And then my recommendation is to check the include stock box, which will create a stock model that then gets consumed by the setup to create toolpaths, which is really helpful and also creates a remnant cut line. Um, and the remnant cut line basically just prevents you from having to uh, create a sketch of your own. And it just makes one for you automatically, which is really nice. So the <laughs> all the sheets, uh, Are from this top view, I like to <laughs> zoom around and find what they look like and then just quickly create a named view for the nests, um, which makes it easier to go like back and forth from the model to the nests um, if that's what you need to do. And then we can go through, see what they look like. Here's a good example of that remnant cut line is this, that blue sketch line. Basically just gives me this nice, uh, square left over some some tools some water jets or plasma cutters will have like a saw option but this lets you bypass that kind of manual process um once i have some nests i can click through and look at them which is which is great but to get more information the compare dialog when you right click on any number of nests uh sheets or studies you can access the compare dialog which shows you more in-depth uh kind of information so here's where that costing comes in handy. It'll tell me like the total nested cost, which I think is just some math about the cost of each sheet and the total usage of each sheet, uh, the remnant cost. So this makes it nice for either material ordering or quoting. If you have a job, how much should you charge them? Really easy way to do this. You can customize um, the things that you see, the, param the parameters that you see on here. And then you can also change the view. Uh, the colors are a little slow to update, but they are helpful to like view from different ways, the shape, the, or, the orientation, things like that. Um, what we aren't great at today is like grain control. Um, so if you're cutting a lot of wood that is coming down the pipeline soon, but for sheet metal generally, 
you know, it's a good solution. Uh, okay, here's the magic. <laughs> so let's say I go back into the design workspace and I want to change the dimensions of the snowplow. Let's say I have truck mounts that are wider. So I need to compensate for that. I'll click okay here. It's gonna update this whole assembly. So my truck mounts are wider now. Um, I'll hop back. Ooh, actually, I'll update all my flat patterns. So that's a key part of this workflow. If you don't update your flat patterns, the nest will not consume the new designs. So I'll update the flat patterns on the design side. It really is that fast. Like there's no real calculation time there, um, at least on this model. I'll hop on, back into the manufacturer workspace. And Fusion will tell me which specific nests are out of date. So all these ones that don't have a little red exclamation point, everything is fine. They don't need to be updated. These two nests had components in them that were changed. So I'll just quickly generate those two nests and that's all I really have to do. So that's great. Um, pretty seamless, pretty easy really smart, <laughs> intelligent nesting to know exactly which one. So I don't have to, like if I was using a third-party nesting tool, I don't have to go through a DXF export process. I don't have to re-import anything. I don't have to go through this kind of like lossy back and forth using um, 2D information. I can just do it all with Infusion. Let me find my nested sheets. So let's now get into some tool pathing. I guess I can see the updated ones. Oh, that stock is so small. <laughs> um, so let's tool path this, for example. To get some tool paths on this, I'm going to right click and say, create setup from manufacturing model, which automatically creates a cutting setup for me, automatically picks the manufacturing model um, as my models and then automatically grabs that solid, which I can also see under this sheet, the stock body as my stock, which is great. So really simple to go from nested sheet to manufacturing setup, which it then drops at the bottom of my browser here. I'm going to hide the stock for now because it makes it easier to pick my individual parts when I'm toolpathing. But this is another pretty magical thing. Um, I'm going to create a cutting 2D profile is what we call it, a cutting operation. I'm going to really quickly create a plasma tool, um, just pretty much just entering the curve width. Select it. And then I can pick a face which will grab all of the loops on that face. So the, the contours basically of that face inside outside or both. And then I can check the select same plain faces box to grab them across the entire nest because it's grabbing anything in the same plane. So because all these parts are already organized by thickness, I can grab them all at once, which is awesome. Um, I tend to use a water jet. So I like to do inner contours first because the little bits that fall out of those, generally I'm not nervous about um, them being pushed into the nozzle. And then I do the outer loops to make sure things haven't like shifted while I'm cutting, but on a, you know, plasma or laser, it's not as important. So maybe I'll just pick all of them. Um, there's the typical controls here of the height, the passes, you can set your sideways compensation, which I'll get to, I'll change that for the remnant cut. And then if the compensation is happening in computer or control. We also made an update during the quality of life uh, update that the 2D profile calculates way faster now, um, which is which is great. It used to be a little bit slow when you had this sheet is an okay size, but if you had a really really big sheet with a ton of contours, it would it would get bogged down. So that calculation time was um, way better, which is a, an excellent update. <laughs> And then for the remnant cut, I'll just pick that sketch line. I like to set this to be center and I'll click okay. And then much like any series of toolpaths in Fusion, I can post-process these um, in the post library. We have some filters, Jet would be like a, a cutting post. So we support any of these machines for free. 
these posts are uh, free, fully customizable. You can download them from the online post library as well and make any changes that you need to make. Um, so hopefully we're supporting your machine. If you don't see a machine on here that you would like us to support, we can definitely take those requests uh, on the forum. And I think that is, I know we're, we're right up against time. So I think that is pretty much it on nesting. Um, definitely give it a, give it a play around. We would love to hear your feedback, love to hear any questions or comments. Um, one very last final note, the 2D profile face selection is currently only available in 2D profile, which is for contouring, like I just um, showed. We do have a preview though, to enable it for the 2D contour toolpath which is for like a router. So if you're using routing woodworking applications, you can turn that on, um, use it for milling tool paths. Do know it's a preview. Um, don't make any purchasing decisions based on what I just showed. <laughs> it is in progress technology, but we're as always happy to share it early and get any of your feedback. All right. I think that's awesome. all I got. Awesome. It looks like a question came in from John. Will there be a replay? Um, if, if he's referring to the recording of this, then yes. Um, I'll go ahead and post the Kativ YouTube channel here on the, uh, the, the chat room here. So you can subscribe to us. And then once the, uh, the recording of this comes out, you can um, get notified for it. And if it would do any live videos, like we're streaming this to YouTube live as well, you can be notified that we're live, uh, whether it's Fusion 360 or any of, other of the webinars that we do uh, revolving around the collection. So feel free to subscribe to us on YouTube there. And appreciate the information there, especially on nesting there, Marty. That was really interesting. I, I was very uh, hyper uh, focused on just learning it myself. So it's really, really powerful. I know a lot of people are looking forward to having nesting in Fusion 360, especially the sheet metal users. So I think that was very uh, helpful. Nice, I'm glad. Yeah, we're excited to be able to finally have it. Awesome, so I'll give it a, like 20 seconds, 30 seconds here if there's any questions coming in. Um, I also posted the Fusion 360 feedback hub that uh, Mario is mentioning regarding uh, if you want to see any new features or features that you're looking for that you, that are similar to the ones you saw today, um, you can either vote on it in the uh, Fusion 360 Feedback Hub. That's where all these updates really come from, uh, from because the the customers themselves, and, or you can put your your own idea into there as well. So, yeah, don't doesn't seem like any questions are coming in. Um, we do do these every. Uh, once a month on Friday, uh, we hence the Fusion Friday. Um, and it looks like there's another post there uh, in the chat room for the forum. So yeah, if you guys have uh, any questions outside of this, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have my email. I'll, I'll make sure to send, uh, send a follow-up email to everyone here. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to to myself with any further questions if you want to take it offline and we can we can help you with um with whatever autodesk or or ansys questions that you have so thanks thanks again marty for hopping on and uh yeah we'll see you guys next time great thanks for having me thanks everyone yeah take care everyone <laughs>